there's beauty in the world and there's danger. And some things are beautiful and dangerous, like lions and stories. I was at the zoo recently and I wanted to see the lions. But when I got to the enclosure, I couldn't find any. And then finally I spotted one pressed up against the chain link fence way down at one end. And when I approached that lion, he opened his eyes. That was all. That lion didn't roar. He didn't even lift up his head. He did not even swish his tail. I knew that lion was beautiful, but I couldn't really see his beauty. And I knew that lion was dangerous, but we were separated, and I couldn't really feel the danger. That lion had lost all his lionness. Now, my other experience with lions is in an open-topped jeep way out on the savanna in South Africa. Our driver pulled up really close to a big pride of lions. As we approached, every one of those lions lifted up their heads to check us out. And when the driver shut off the engine, the largest of those lions stood up, came towards the jeep, and jumped up onto that warm hood. And it must have felt good, because he sat down. <laughs> that lion was right there. I could see his belly rise and fall. I could smell his breath. I could look right into his eyes, and he looked into mine. And that lion was beautiful. And I was very clear, that lion was dangerous. We sat like that for a couple of minutes, very still. And then the driver reached down and turned on the engine. The lion jumped off, and as we backed away, that lion turned, and that lion roared. That lion had all his lionness. Lions aren't the only thing we put in cages. We put stories in cages, too. For the last decade or so, everything from peer-reviewed journal articles to books to in-flight magazines have been encouraging leaders to tell stories. Stories that would sell the hot new idea, motivate people to follow, spin the scandal so it wouldn't seem quite so bad. Leaders are being coached to use the three-point template for the perfect story the five dimensions of story, or the nine ways that stories can be used. Stories, leaders are being taught that stories are powerful tools. And it's true, stories are powerful. But here's the problem, stories are not tools. They're not tools in the way that Six Sigma and competency analysis and Gantt chart are tools. Stories have an energetic vitality that tools don't have. Stories have an aliveness. I heard a Native American storyteller once say that the stories are alive because we tell them. My experience is a little different. It is that we tell the stories because they are already alive. They are alive whether or not we tell them. And the stories negotiate with us about whether and how they should be told. And if this sounds a little wacky, stay with me here, because you know this. You know this from your own experience. I bet you can think of a time when you were deep in conversation, you were fully engaged, you were talking, and you interrupted yourself. And you said, hey, wait a minute. Why am I telling you this story? I didn't mean to tell you this story. How did we get here? You're telling that story because that story wanted to be told in that moment to those listeners. And so it pushed itself energetically into your conversation. And it's likely that there are other times, times when you were working really hard to make a point, trying to make yourself clear, and you just couldn't do it. And then later, you're brushing your teeth, and a story pops into your head, and you say, oh, that was the story. That's the story I should have told. That would have 
clarified everything. Why didn't I tell that story? You didn't tell that story because that was a time when the story didn't want to be told. Not at that moment, not to those listeners. The stories negotiate with us on the basis of the quality of listening that they and we as their tellers anticipate that they'll receive. Stories are not tools. Stories are more like lions. Now, just like zoos do good work by helping people who will never make it out to the savanna to see a lion up close, so too in our organizations, there are some stories that we want to kind of capture. Stories like the founder story and invention stories and stories of crisis and response are stories that we want to tell over and over because they help to build the culture, they help to build the culture of the organization. So, like lions, some stories do end up in cages. But here's what's important. We always want to make sure that the number of lions on the savanna is greater than the number of lions we keep in zoos. I used to work for a vice president of human resources. His name was Doug. Now, to tell you a little bit about this guy, one day he and I were having a debate about how to deal with a problem employee. And Doug was offering a solution that I thought was too lenient, even kind. And I was protesting, and Doug stopped me. And he said, look, Joe, really, we have two jobs. The first job is to find the high road. And the second job, when we find the high road, is to actually take it. Seriously, how many executives do you know who talk like that? That's the kind of guy Doug was. He was kind and smart and much loved. And then, one day, Doug died. Tragically, unexpectedly, gone. A couple weeks before Doug died, we had gotten a new CEO. His name was Mike. And when Doug died, Mike ordered us to arrange for three very large back-to-back -back meetings, 500 employees each, where Mike would announce Doug's death. In the first session, Mike came to the podium and he started to tell a story about Doug. And as soon as he started to tell it, I thought, that story can't be true. But at a certain point in the story, Mike's voice cracked, he paused. He wiped a tear from his eye. He collected himself, and he finished his talk. I stayed to usher in the next group of employees. And when they were settled, Mike told the exact same story about Doug. And at the exact same point, Mike's voice cracked. He paused. He wiped a tear from his eye. So, I stayed for the third session, and I don't even need to tell you what happened. <laughs> when it was over, I went racing back to my office. I wanted to tell my colleagues the story of Mike's performance in the fake tear, but that story was alive on the savanna, and that story got there way ahead of me. My colleagues were already abuzz. Mike hardly even knew Doug. That story couldn't have been true. The whole talk was a sham. No one believed Mike. And so a new story emerged, the story of how none of us would ever, ever trust Mike. <laughs> and that story was alive on the savanna, too. That story roared. Lions that languish in cages seldom roar. They lose their lionness. And Mike's story about Doug, it had no Dougness. Mike was trying to use a story like a tool, but stories aren't tools. 
And so it broke out of its cage. Stories are powerful. They are beautiful. They are dangerous. Cages can diminish their beauty, but you can't diminish the danger. Mike tried to tame a story, and it turned on him. Now, I feel compelled to say something about the difference between Mike's cage story about Doug and the stories I've been telling you today. And that difference really is embedded in two things. One is the relation that we have to the stories that we tell. And the second is our intention when we tell those stories. I saw that lion in the zoo and the ones on the savanna. I stayed to listen to Mike's talk three times in a row. I can stand in an authentic relationship with those stories. And when I tell them to you here today, I tell them with the hope that they will provoke your thinking about storytelling, and not with the intention that they will get you thinking something about me. Mike constructed a story, and, when, and he couldn't stand in authentic relationship to that constructed story. And when he told it, he told it with the intention to show people something about him and not something about Doug. Powerful storytelling is when we tell stories of our own experience the way we experienced it. Conveying the story as food for thought and not with the intention of manipulating our listeners into doing or thinking something in particular. If you're a leader, of course you should tell stories. But if the only stories you have are ones that you have to put in cages, then that is a time when you should not tell stories. That is a time to do something else. So, what could Mike have done? Mike didn't have a story about Doug that was alive on the savanna, but he did have some choices. Mike could have invited those of us who knew Doug well to tell him some of our stories about Doug. And then Mike could have gotten on that stage and he could have said, look, I only knew Doug for a couple of weeks, but here's what I know about him from the stories I've heard you tell. Or even better, Mike could have invited some of us to come up. He could have shared that stage like a warm hood to come and tell our stories about Doug directly to our fellow employees. Little stories, like the one I just told you about the high road. Instead of trying to cage the perfect story, Mike could have listened. So, that's Mike. What about you? What about you? If you don't have a story that you can stand in authentic relationship to, then that's a time to switch from storytelling to story listening. It's a time to switch. Don't worry about the three-point template for constructing the perfect story. There are stories all around you that people would love for you to hear. What you need is a warm hood. You need a warm hood for those stories to jump up on close enough so that you can smell their breath. Now, when you're a leader, it's easy to frighten people and their stories, and so you need to experiment with ways to ask questions, invite the stories, welcome them onto that warm hood. And once they get there, the next step is to slow down. Shut off the engine so that you can really listen. Is it dangerous, this listening? Sure it is. But the danger is always entwined with beauty. You may hear some bad things, but cage, no cage, there's always risk. So you might as well have it from the stories that are already roaming around your organization. Listening is sometimes more difficult than telling, but listening is what makes storytelling possible. It's what makes storytelling worthwhile. If you're a leader, you can tell powerful stories, but sometimes it's better to listen 
powerfully. Make a warm hood. Then you'll be able to look the stories of your organization right in the eye. You'll be able to hear them roar.